Today's episode of the Believe in Steelers podcast is brought to you by betonline.ag. Ike, they've been rocking with us since day one. NBA playoffs in full swing, NHL playoffs in full swing. We just saw Phil Mickelson win the PGA Championship, another major at the age of 50. But if you want to place a wager on any of the action that's going on, Bet Online is the place to do it. Any sport, any category, any time of the day, just go to Bet Online. Head to the website betonline.ag or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. All right, cue the music. It's time to start the show. And welcome into another edition of the Believe in Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Mark Bergen, joined as always by my guy, two-time Super Bowl champion and 12-year veteran of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Ike Taylor. Ike T, loaded show today. We've got a mailbag to answer listeners and viewers' questions. I'm really excited to chop it up and talk with you about it. This is like one of my favorite things we get to do, and you and I can just go back and forth. How are you doing today, my guy? I'm good, Mark. A little downtime. You know what I'm saying? We got a little downtime. Uh, I know your brain just be wandering all the time when it comes to football and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you're a multi-sport kind of guy, so it's good just talking to you. So when you came up with the mailbag, I'm like, man, I'm sitting there talking to myself like, man, I'm wondering the hell what Mark going to ask me today. We're not going to go too far outside the box, at least to start out. And we're going to start with where you think wide receiver Julio Jones will end up playing for in the 2021 season. I know you saw the clip on FS1 where it's kind of unclear if he knew he was on speakerphone with Uncle Shannon Sharp. I think Shannon's probably too smart of a guy not to have that staged. I thought it was compelling television. We only see the viral clip. People lose their minds on social media of, well, if Julio didn't know he was being recorded, how that could potentially be illegal. I think Shannon, like there's too many producers on that show to not know what they were doing. I found it to be incredibly compelling and entertaining television. But where do you think he winds up? Because if he's going to garner a salary just north of $15 million, there's only a handful of teams who still have the salary cap space to be able to afford his salary. But come week one of the 2021 season, Ike, where do you think Julio winds up? Oh, man. Dang, that's a good question, bro. They were saying the Patriots. Uh, I don't know if you want to be with Cam and company. Oof. Off the top. Let's say he go to Houston. Mm-hmm. Let's say he slide down to Houston. Um. Right now, I'll look at I'll look at the Patriots. The Patriots the are Patriots the third now. favorite, Ike, at plus five hundred. The Tennessee Titans are the favorite, and that's a team that makes sense to me because you got AJ Brown on one side. You fill the void left by Corey Davis. Right. Now you've got a one-two tandem on the outside, make life easier for. Uh, A.J. Brown, Ryan Tannehill, the quarterback, and then we know what Derrick Henry can do out of the backfield. The Falcons are the second favorite, his current team right now. I kind of think he stays in Atlanta. I would love to see the one-two combination that Jones could pair with their first-round draft pick and Kyle Pitts as well. So I would love to see Matt Ryan have weapons available. I know he said he's wanted out, but I mentioned the $15 million. He's due about $15.3 million this season, which means as it stands right now, there are only 11 teams that currently have the amount of cap space necessary to sign him. I think he's going to end up staying in Atlanta. That's just my two cents worth. But again, the favorite right now is Tennessee. Like you mentioned the Patriots, the Patriots, the third favorite. And we know what Bill Belichick and the Patriots did this offseason with all of the offseason signings and acquisitions that they made, which is really unlike Bill Belichick. Yeah. Also, I was just looking at it. I was looking at DeAndre Hopkins 
Instagram and he was talking about AJ Green and Julio and they all took a picture with Uncle Michael Irvin. So, of course, DeAndre already got AJ Green over there. And under the caption, there was a uh, DeAndre Hopkins said, "You remember what we talked about?" And he was talking to Julio Jones. So, I mean, I wouldn't take that out of a possibility of going to Atlanta as well. But getting back to what you was talking about, Mark, I say Atlanta first. Yes, I agree with you on Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, why not stay with Kyle Pitts, a young stud, the tight end position? We saw what Julio yeah. Jones did when he had Tony Gonzalez sitting at sitting at that tight end position. Now you give another weapon to. Uh, Matt Ryan and company, you already got Ridley. Ridley sitting over there. He doing this thing on the other side as a youngster. Honestly, it really makes sense if he just sitting in Atlanta, even though he said he wanted out. I you hope meant- Uncle I hope Uncle Uncle Shannon did give him some kind of warning. But just yeah. off the just off of what I saw, I don't think he did. <laughs> okay and think, that's the I thing think, is we don't know like that's the one thing everyone was just like well this is definitely illegal and it's like well we don't know what went into him calling julio and then we saw on the side like i said incredibly see, I, thought un- I thought it was unscripted and this how i know it was unscripted if you pay attention before it hung up mm-hmm. uncle shannon said oh yeah and we live <laughs> he didn't say that before he <laughs> asked him the question he said that after he asked them the question. So if you would have forewarned him, Julio might have gave a might have would have gave a different answer. But the fact, and I pay attention to everything, but the fact that he said, Oh yeah, we live at the end, in the back of my mind, I said, Damn, Julio didn't even know. Ike, if I ever call you on the phone and and we are in a live situation, that'll be the first thing that comes out of my mouth. See? You'll be the first to know. Likewise. Yes. Likewise. Yes. Or even if you're on just speaker photo, there are other people in the in the Likewise. area where it's just like, hey, man, you're on speaker with whoever surrounding the area. You mentioned the videos of them working out together. One last thing with this on Sunday, video surfaced of Derrick Henry and Julio working out together as well. So Titans, again, the favorite right now. Hey, we'll listen, see. I can, I can, you know, they like, you know, Coach Vrabel, he like his big ass receivers that look like tight ends. <laughs> <laughs> we we do know that for a fact. You know, he likes strong physicality. That's that's the name of his game. You know, from Corey Davis to AJ Brown, now it's probably it's a possibility Julio can get to Tennessee. You already know his his running back is bigger than all the offensive linemen in the NFL. So <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 Cody Vrabel, man. He he just an old school, he an old Coach Bray was just an old school coach, man. He just won't – he want to take all his all his players to a bar and just beat up everybody. <laughs> that's his mentality. <laughs> that's that's how Coach Bray would draft and go out the free agents. Give me guys that we feel like going out and we wind up getting into a fight. All my guys can beat up all your guys every day. Let's draft them kind of guys. <laughs> Let's draft them kind of guys. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we'll see. Former Steeler Bud Dupree going over to Tennessee this offseason as well. We'll see where Julio winds up. I think it would be an incredible pairing in Tennessee. I kind of hope he stays in Atlanta, see what he does. I agree. With but let, let's keep it moving. We'll get to the next question. Mark B. in Florida writes in, and uh, I say? wrote this question, Ike. And I don't know if you're going to want to hear this, but – are we sure this is Ben Roethlisberger's last year with the Steelers? I think so. Hold on. You tell me, let me go to my mailbag. Tell me some Mark B in Florida. <laughs> That's you all day. Uh, I think so. My personal opinion, Mark B in Florida, <laughs> talking about yourself. I think Big Ben. Uh, it's a good question, I, Ike. No, I think this is his last year, though. I think personally this is last year. Um, I think the team wants to move on. Uh, they were just kind of stuck in the pickle. Um, Juju came back. I think a lot of other players kind of make it hard. Uh, Pouncey left. He retired. Uh, you getting some? You, you didn't have some guys who got hurt on the offensive line last year. The young guys got a lot of reps last year, and they probably wasn't expected to get them reps, but they did. So that makes them a year ahead when it comes down to the offensive line. You draft your stud and Najee Harris. At the running back position, you get your young tight end, baby Gronk, coming from Penn State. So, but by the end of the day, I just think as an organization, they will move on 
after this year. I think they're going to give seven. This, this is one more chance, you know, to get that sour taste out of his mouth, losing to Cleveland Brown in the way they lost to the Cleveland Browns at home. Um, but, yeah, they, they they got the pieces to the puzzle around him. It's just, it's just on him if you want to match him up. And, you know, I always said since last year, the best thing I think, you know, that Pittsburgh offense can do, especially a young offense line and an aging big band is him turning around and hand that ball off. And it's going to be some games where he need to have a shootout. That's going to come, of course. That That's not going to be an issue. Having shootouts with Big Ben throwing for, you know, 300-plus yards, that's not an issue for him. But Pittsburgh got to get back to the old Pittsburgh. That's playoff Pittsburgh, and that's running the ball. And that's why they got Najee Harris. So, for me, my personal opinion, I think, you know, they, they're going to – they gave life support to Big Ben this year. We said, we're going to give you one more year, bro. We're going to give you one more year, and that take off from there. This is not going to be the show for our listeners and viewers of the Believe in Steelers podcast that is going to overanalyze what happens in OTAs. I think it's great that Big Ben is there and the other quarterbacks getting reps with the receivers, but I'm not going to overanalyze where it's like, wow, he hit his receiver in stride on that one. Like For me, let's get into a few games of the 2021 season, and I'll let you know what I see once we get to that point. I'm not going to overanalyze the underwear Olympics when they're in a t-shirt and shorts and helmets. Just, you know, it, it's good that he's there for continuity purposes, but this show is not going to be, wow, he was great on this pass to this receiver. I think it's awesome. He's there. This show is not going to be that, but I just want to keep that question in the back of our mind, Ike, because he is under contract through the season at $14 million. Mason Rudolph, the only co- quarterback under contract, through the 2022 season with uh, uh, Dwayne Haskins and then Josh Dobbs also on the roster. So just put that in the back of your mind. If Big Ben tears it up this season where it's just like, would they be able to work out uh, a favorable deal? I'm with you, Ike. I think it's going to be one last ride this year. But just because we don't – there is uncertainty beyond the 2021 season. I wouldn't rule it out to say, yeah, Big Ben's definitely hanging it up. I, I am not in that camp. Yeah, it, I, I'm glad you're not one of them guys who is over analyzing the OTAs, you know, helmets and shorts. It's good for the rookies to get experience, get their feet wet, get 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 in the surrounding city, understand the city a little bit before the, the regular season really do start. Uh, get familiar with a few things as, as, as well as being a professional, going to meetings, lifting, understanding how it is to be a professional. I agree with the OTAs in that aspect. But, um, for me, it's just looking at what the veterans going to say. So I tell you this all the time, you know, the players talk when they talk post or pre, regardless of when they do talk, they know what they're talking about. So for me, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, like a, a Joe Hayden, who are we going to talk about this year? Because last year he talked about Chase Claypool and Chase Claypool wind up being a damn dog. So for me on the offensive on the offensive side, who mm-hmm. who are they gonna talk about on the defensive side? Is it gonna be a high smith? You just you just never know. So I, I tend to listen to the players and how they talk on who they like, because usually who they like wind up blossoming, you know. So that's for the OTAs, that's what I look at. I look at what other players say about other players in this offseason right now. Yeah, 11 rookie touchdowns for Claypool tying a Steelers record. We'll go to the next question, Ike. And speaking of OTAs, training camp a few months away, but it feels like it's right around the corner. Right. Which Steelers player had the best training camp entrance during your playing days? Uh, I'm sorry. I got to take these Zertex. Um, by far for me, it's Antonio Brown. Are you talking you know, the it, helicopter? No, I ain't even talking the helicopter. Man, the man, the man, the man had. The man had a driver, an old school legendary driver, pull up in the old school Phantom Rolls Royce. So him and the damn driver was down there dressed alike, an old school. I said, man, this dude here. I said, man, this dude. The helicopter, man. The heli- I seen the helicopter before. I, uh, Reggie Wayne did the helicopter back in the day. So I didn't see the helicopter entrance. That was cool. But when he put up in that old, when when AB put up in that old school. With a butler and a butler open the door for him. Like, damn, the dude about 40 more years older than you, AB, you can't open the door for yourself. <laughs> you, got, 
you gotta have a damn butler over the door for you. But I guess that's that's just the procedure on how that go. But yeah, A B A B was always just like off the wall when it came down to certain interests, man. A B A B a little bit different. So A A B by far for me always stood out when he came to the training camp. See, I thought you might go with Brett Kiesel arriving in a tractor during the 2012 season. I know James Harrison, your teammate, had a few dramatic entrances. He came in a fire truck right. one year, and then he was in the smart car in 2009, rolling up to Latrobe in the smart car. And we know how big James is. James is bigger than the damn car. Yeah, James, James lived that car in the weight room. <laughs> James drove in with that car. And messed around and, and, and pulled the car in the weight room and then put the car on the bench press. I believe it too. I, I believe it. If you check out his Instagram, <laughs> if you want some like Monday motivation, like check out James Harrison's Instagram. The things he does, and you just see what he's doing on a, like a squat or a bench press and the bar is bending. It's it's unbelievable. He different, though. It's unbelievable. Debo a little bit different, man. That, that that always been him though. He he just liked men different. So, I mean, all right, all right. Speaking good. of your former Steelers teammates, uh-huh. like, this lends itself next to our next best question. So, this question surfaced. I saw you were going back and forth with Breath Kiesel on uh, Twitter, and you guys were talking about how your Steelers teammates used to play basketball with one another during the off season. So what I want to know is who is the best Steelers basketball player? Because you put this out on Twitter, Ike. You were saying something along the lines that you guys beat a pro-am team Bro, we, and the men's, uh, the, the Pittsburgh Panthers men's yeah. college basketball team. Like, what what is this story? Me, people forget Brett Kiesel was an All-American in Wyoming. He was an All-American basketball player. Uh, Antoine Randall L., you know he played at Indiana. Mm-hmm. Under Bobby Knight. Correct. Chris Hope, DeShay Townsend, Hans Ward, Lee Mays. And we, we didn't lose in all – hold on. I'm sneezing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. You're, it's crazy. you're fine. In the offseason, we played like 60 games. That's That was our conditioning. We didn't lose a game. Well, we went into your house. Oh, excuse me. This is the truth. God bless me. We went into your house, took your girl, opened your refrigerator, ate your food, whooped you in basketball. Oh, <laughs> Triple. We're up to three. I'm keeping tally over here, Ike. I know. Oh, we got a home run. That's four now. And won the basketball game. Okay. When I when I say when I say we was, bro. We had a, the gym used to be packed because we was doing this after the Super Bowls. Mm-hmm. The gyms and we used to show off. <sighs> Excuse me. So of all of the players you mentioned, who was the absolute best player in basketball among your? No. Okay. Okay. You, you won't say. You see, that's saying a lot because you mentioned Randall all played at IU under Bobby Knight, and so he was a multi-sport athlete, not just playing he football. Was. He played varsity baseball one year at IU as well. A, a player you didn't mention, who I thought you might, defensive end Aaron Smith, who's now yeah. an assistant basketball coach. He played. He was an all-state player in oh. high school in Colorado. So should we, if we need to take a break, guy, because you're sneezing, just say the word, just say the word, but you got the My sniffles. Bad. This, this real live, my allergies kicking in. <laughs> These people got to see all this. Um, Smitty, Smitty, Smitty was, Smitty was good. He was good, but bro, me? Where well, I was. So I was down in the post, a little 6'2", Ike Taylor down in the post, banging with the seven feet, 6'9", guys. That was me. Then I mess around. Don't let me catch you on the fast break because I'm I'm coming down the lane. Somebody's going to be on the poster. Yeah. Somebody's yeah. going to be on the poster. 
we're I'm just gonna throw the ball near the rim, Mike, and you can go up and get it. That, was, that, that was me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um the next question that I have, and this is kind of odd, an out of the box question. There's a great New York Times bestselling author by the name of Malcolm Gladwell, and he has a podcast called Revisionist History, Ike. And he did a whole episode on if Wilt Chamberlain had shot his free throws underhanded, granny style, like the Hall of Famer Rick Barry, how much more effective he could be. So this kind of got my creative juices flowing. Will we see an ambidextrous NFL quarterback in our lifetimes? And the reason I ask this question is, to me, this is the next iteration of the no-look passes that we see from Patrick Mahomes, the crazy cross-body throws we see from Aaron Rodgers. Why throw across your body if I could just use my other hand to throw the football? I think this is something that eventually is going to be taught, but we just haven't even tapped into yet but what say you do you think we'll see an ambidextrous quarterback at some point in our life um uh, yeah that's a hell of a question too that's a hell Thank of a you. thought to be that's that's a hell of a thought to be honest with you um mark and that i would never say nothing or anything is it possible that is possible that is that is that is that is something i never thought about but i watch boxing and i watch softballs and I watch guys who are unorthodox and you know them guys got to be able to 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 kind of like switch hit like kind of like being a switch hit in baseball you know what I'm saying so you using really using both sides of the brain but to to have a quarterback who can possibly switch hit um oh my god that that'll be something new that'll be that in 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 it that won't come that won't come often They'll probably come once every seventy years, because that's that's hard, bro. That that gotta be that gotta be God given, because that kind of gotta be natural. Mm-hmm. But I I can see I can see somebody coming around in our lifetime, Mark. I can see somebody coming around and being uh ambidextrous. I can see that all day. I can see one. I can see uh, I can see before before the good man come to get us. I can see a quarterback able to throw right or left. And, and and make it look like it's natural. Man, I'm not talking about hard, just natural. But that's a hell of a question, bro. That's a hell of a question. But I, I can't see it. I I can't see that coming. I can see that coming, bro. These kids are just too talented right now. It's they got too many God given gifts. Like, you know, at first, you know, when, when you was right handed, your parents didn't want you to throw left. Mm-hmm. Now it's now it's good to be a lefty. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. It's 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 crazy that you just even came up with a thought, but Mark, I can I can see that. And yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully I, I pray I pray I do I pray we do get to see it in our lifetime. Me too, <clears throat> me too. So apparently, a quick Google search shows that only one percent of people are ambidextrous. But to me, it would be like we know how hard it is to throw across your body if you're right-handed, rolling left to try to throw across your body. How hard that is. Why not just teach it where you throw the ball with the other hand? And I know we've seen Patrick Mahomes have to maneuver out of a sack and kind of, uh, and Brett Favre used to do this back in the day too, where he just kind of flings the ball with his opposite hand. If you actually just teach it that way and have the right technique to where you do that over and over and over growing up, I think that's just the natural progression of, again, the no-look passes we see from Patrick Mahomes. Let me give a shout-out, too, to Matthew Stafford. I've seen a few clips of him throwing the no-look passes. I know that's, like, the new trend. And those videos always go viral, too, where it's like, yo, check out this touchdown pass where he completely freezes the defender because he's looking one way and throws the other. Yeah, that will be special. But I think that will have to come. That 1%, that will have to be natural, Mark. Yeah, as much as you probably want to teach somebody – Mm-hmm. Then you got to you got to find a coordinator who is open minded just as well as that player. You know what I'm saying? So you you got to find an OC who be like, okay, this is a new challenge. I'm all in for it. You know what I'm saying? Not an old school OC who just want to be like, man, my way or the highway. It, everything got to be on the same page. 
For, I'm with for, I'm with you there. I because there used to be there was like a high school coach. I forget which state this was, but he would always go for it on fourth down. He would always attempt an onside kick, and he went on to have a tremendous level of success because he looked at the statistics by and large. He also taught and coached his team that way. Being open minded, I think, might be the biggest challenge with that. From you have to have a coach who's on board, let player. alone a player with the ability. I'm with you there. Yeah, that's 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 my main concern. You you find a special player like that, that coach got to be all in. He he, he got to be all because it's gonna be hard, bro. Just picture coaching, you know, a guy who's ambidextrous, bro. That that's gonna be hard as hell. You know, you got to be open minded. You know, from calling plays, your whole your whole terminology got to change. To be honest with you, it's, it's just it just got to change. But boy, you will give defenses hell. If I'm, if I'm a coach yeah. and I'm playing an Ambi, boy, I, that's hell. Yeah. Like I said, it was kind of inspired. I was listening to Malcolm Gladwell, New York Times bestseller, and then I've been watching a bunch of NBA playoff basketball, and you see how talented – I know Steph Curry and the Warriors got knocked out, but you see what he's able to do with the basketball. And it just kind of got my creative juices flowing. And I'm like, I cannot wait to ask Ike about this. No, that's a hell of a question, bro. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a real good question, though. Let's move to the next question. And I know I've asked you a little bit about this, but now that the rookies are into o OTAs, uh -huh. do you ever recall a circumstance either when you were a rookie or later on a veteran player where the rookies had to go and pay for a veteran's dinner when you went out? to eat as teammates? Yeah, I had to pay my rookie dinner. Me, Troy, me, Troy, and Alonzo Jackson. And uh, I should almost cry. Well, because you guys cry. had a smaller rookie class as well. Man, we only got five guys who got drafted. It was Troy, Alonzo Jackson, me, Brian St. Pierre, JT Wall, fullback. That was only five because they – went up so many picks to get Troy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, man, that rookie dinner, I think that rookie dinner was like uh, seven grand. So the rookie <laughs> for one dinner. Meal. For one meal. <laughs> the rookie dinner, that was for the defense. That was seven grand. But then we had a defensive back dinner, rookie dinner. And that was probably like three. I'm like, God, damn, that's that's ten thousand. That's $10,000. On two dinners. I said, man, y'all know what y'all... I said, look here, look here. Man, we did better by going to Publix or Win Dixon somewhere and let my mama come up and cook for y'all. <laughs> 10 grand. But th thank God Troy was a first rounder. Alonzo Jackson was a second rounder. So, you know, they ain't, they ain't asked. They ain't asked. So I ain't got the time to really do too much. But they sure did put a dent in my pocket, though. You know, I had I had to I had to cut a few trips. I had to cut a few trips down. You know, I was thinking I was gonna do something in the offseason, Mark and Mark. I had to shut a few trips down. You know, I couldn't I couldn't take that trip to Miami. I couldn't take that trip. I had to sit my butt in Pittsburgh and just bring whatever whatever city or state I thought I wanted to be, I had to bring that to me. Did you ever have to carry like any of your teammates' bags or anything? Like I feel like this is like a level of I, <clears throat> I don't know if you could call it rookie hazing, but I just feel like you like I don't think Chase Claypool or Knight from last year or Nige is really doing that in the new school. But did you have to do any of that when you played as I had a carry like uh Joy Porter, James, Joey Porter, James Harris, I mean James Ferry, and Casey Hampton. I had to carry their uh, helmets up to the locker after practice, helmets and shoulder pads. But I ain't play that hazing stuff. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't, I said, look, if y'all want to haze me, we just going to fight till one of us. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not doing the hazing, but I did carry, yeah. I did carry the pads and helmets up uh, for training camp every day out of the practice. I did, I did do that. Then when I became a veteran, I wasn't, I wasn't doing that to the rookies. Like, I ain't, I ain't one of, really, I just did it because that was protocol, but it, I didn't do that to it. So, you know, the rookies, I was like, nah, man, I got my own. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I took care of my young guys. I never put them in a situation I was in. Even though I wasn't in a bad situation, I just didn't want to do it. 
Well, I know a lot of the veterans took you under their wing. We talked to James Ferrier about this on the Believe in Steelers podcast many months ago, and I'd encourage our listeners to go check out that episode. And then, oh, yeah. Ike, I know you've always mentioned in other interviews that you did that Deshae Townsend got you a truck Man, early on in your career. So it's just like it, it's, you know, yeah, they're making you, you know, foot the bill at a nice meal, but they also do reciprocate. Man, Deshae gave me his – he had a, a – a loner Ford Expedition, and uh, he was like, he was like, young buck, you got a, you got a, you got a whip. I said, no, I ain't, I ain't got no whip. He said, man, I got an extra car, man. Get lost. I said, for real? He was like, yeah, just bring it back to me when you get your first check. I said, bro. So I, I had a truck for like six months. I said, well, dang, what you? Wow. What you? What you? What you want me to do? So I took. He gave me that. And I did that from that point on. That's exactly like any rookie I felt like needed some help, whether helping his mom pay a bill or a unrestricted free agent or somebody who ain't had no money, somebody who was down bad, somebody that needed a car, I paid for it. Like, just surprised him and paid for it. Like, hey, bro, here go the keys to the car outside. Like, what? Like, yeah, bro, I heard, I heard, I heard, I heard your situation won't good or – Pay for his mom or his sister or whoever he had for the whole year. Like, hey, bro, rent took care of for the whole year, bro. Wow. So wow. just like I reciprocated all that back. So Deshae showed me love. Joey Porter showed me love. James Ferrier showed me the most love. And uh, I just I just poured the love back. So anytime I was able to help, that's exactly – what I did, man, I was, just, I was just giving gifts, like, to my young boys who I felt like deserved it. But really, I knew they really weren't going to have the opportunity. I was just making sure they were straight. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Ike, a few other questions we need to get to. I saw your Instagram post, I think it was either earlier this week or last week, where you're walking out of the tunnel and you go from walk on to 12 years in the league. You did a dozen. I don't know if I've ever heard you told the whole story of how you started playing football at Louisiana and Lafayette because you were a walk on there. Like, how did that even come about? Like, I don't think I've ever like really hear you dig deep and tell how you got started playing college football there. I mean, we had a uh, we had a flag football team called the Nola Boys. So we had a flag football team. We, we used to smack everybody in the in the surrounding area. So we used to. At UL, so it was from either from Louisiana all the way to Beaumont, Texas. And we used to win all the tournaments. So is this like an intramural team? Yeah, this is intramural. Wound up playing the Superdome. The winner to the Superdome had a chance to be in a national championship in Hawaii. That was that was for the intramural. So, you know, we like 13 deep. We was like, bro, we finna go to Hawaii. We play some, we play some old white boys, right? And we looking at them, we like, man, we about to smack these fools. But little did we know, there was three, four time champions. Like them boy, them boys was on. Point. I'm talking about when I say older, they was mm-hmm. like 15 years older than us. Wow. But they they been playing with each other for so long. So we get in the game. We was going by series, the best two out of three. We won the first game. We were like, man, we just need to win two, one more. We good. But they wound up winning, you know, two in a row and getting us up out of there. I think I still talk to one of them dudes to this day. Like, they, them boys had a – them boys on point, man. Them boys had a squad, a nice little squad. It was a competitive game, and we all just shook hands after. Matter of fact, we went out, too, and just and just parted and kicked it and all that good stuff. But, yeah, one of the coaches was like, man, you need to come out and play football because I was a quarterback, safety – receiver, running back. He was like, bro, you, you need to come out and play football. I said, all right. Came out, played football. He told me the dates I need to walk on. Came out, did the dates, walked on. Hang like, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're, you're saying just come out and play, like, so he, like, it's one thing to dominate at, at a flag football intramural level, 
Right. What went into, I guess, the when you're going on as a walk on, like what went into that to that tryout? Because this is the part where you gloss over and this is the part I lose you, Ike, of just like you, you're playing on an intramural squad at a pretty high level. But right. then to say, OK, you're, you know, at a walk on tryout to then you're actually playing at Mark, a division one school. Like, how this, does that happen? This 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 my this is my personal opinion. We had more people come to our intramural games than people actually going to our, to, our, to our college football games. Our intramural football games used to be so packed because we had all the girls. We had all the girls. We had all the girls. We was, we was, it was 13 guys from New Orleans that knew how to dress, knew how to talk, super savvy, very athletic, very cool, always open to listen to whoever, went, had a DJ. We was doing DJs before DJs. We had DJs before the game. We uh, one, of, one of our homeboys, his mom had a food truck way back in the day. She used to come down to the food truck, so it was just a live party. When I say that thing used to be more packed than our actual college football team, that when one of the coaches came, and he was like, bro, you need to come. You need to come try out, bro. What position? I said running back. I ain't even hesitate. I said, man, I play. I play running back. I play running back uh, high school. He was like, come on now. Came so on hang, out hang on though. What year was this when you were in college though? So I got to college in uh, 1998. So this was the end of 1999, going into uh, 2000. <laughs> This is un- See, I've never heard you like dig. Th- this story is unbelievable to me. So you're what a sophomore going into your junior sophomore year. Sophomore going into my junior year, I walked on spring. Um, hand on my business at running back, but you know I was a walk on, and they, they recruited some running backs. One was from Crowley, Louisiana. The other running back was from New Orleans. So you know they they looking at me like. Okay, he'll walk on, but if you ask anybody else who was on the team, like on defense, like who give who give y'all the most problems? They'll be like, I like I give us the most problems. Matter of fact, I was pretty damn good because we played Terrell Suggs at Arizona State. Mm-hmm. And I wound up having like a 67-yard touchdown against them boys. Against Arizona State. Mm-hmm. I remember that clearly. But uh yeah, I was averaging like five point two yards a carry. I was like, then with coach, so I wanted to get my scholarship right before the fall season of my junior year. Coach Ricky Bustle came from Virginia Tech. Yeah, he was coaching Mike Vick. He said, "Uh, oh, I can get you to the league ASAP." I said, "What you mean?" He said. Boy, you're going to be a hell of a running back. I said, nah, coach, I'm playing corner. He was like, corner? Why the hell are you playing cornerback? I said, I think my best option is, is to play corner. Coach Tom Shaw been telling me to play corner. Coach Gary Payton, a hell of a, hell of a OC and cornerback coach. He said, look, he talked just like this. He from Texas. Say, all right. I said, yes, sir. I'm going to go on and switch you over there to – to cornerback, we're going to get this new coach. I'm going to switch you to cornerback and tell him you all in with the cornerback. And I said, I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm telling you, between you and that boy, Charles Tillman Peanut, boy, we going to have a hell of a secondary. We just need to work on a few things with you. And I was like, coach, whatever, whatever you want me to do. It, do I get a chance to start? He said, hell yeah, if you work your butt off. I don't think that's going to be a problem. I said, all right, if it, it just if it just come down to me working my butt off, that's easy. So me, Charles Tillman, my senior y'all wind up switching to corner. Me, I was the shortest, I was the shortest out of the secondary. Mm-hmm. Me, Charles Tillman, Kyrie's Abel, uh, Brian Demon. Brian Demon, Kyrie's Abel was our two safeties. It's, Six three, six four safeties. Uh, Peanut was six two and a half. I was six two. I was the shortest out of secondary. When I say we used to, 
All coach, all coach had us do was you get him, you get him, and you get him. That's all he did. <laughs> that's 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 yeah. all that's all we did was play man. So, but yeah, that's one of them coaches came. He was like, why why are y'all intramural games? Even our basketball intramural games was packed. Marky Mark. He was like. <laughs> Did any of the players you played intramurals with also play with you yeah, yeah, once yeah. you started uh, no, lot, playing guys, on the actual lot, team? So a lot of guys from uh, intramural basketball that I played with actually played for our basketball team. So we just used to all hang out. Gotcha. Nah, the, the guys from intramural football couldn't play flag. I mean, the guys, us intramural football, you couldn't play college football yeah. at the same time. Like, yeah. they won't let that. Well, bro. When I say when I say our games used to be packed, Mark, live, <laughs> what a phase used to be. Then when they found out I was on a team, oh, uh, I gave them boys, I gave them something to talk about. They was like, oh, a dog that made the team, my dog that got a scholarship. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah, three four hundred deep. Just, 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 just off of Ike Taylor, Ike Taylor shirts, because you know, you don't know if you remember them airbrush. You get your shirts airbrush, your white t-shirts airbrush. Yeah. Oh yeah. Airbrush yeah, shirt. Yeah. Yes. I had a whole section, <laughs> and, and at the time, I wasn't even, I wasn't even starting. When I was playing running back, I wasn't even starting, but I still, I still, New Orleans, New Orleans was repping the hell out of Ike Taylor. I, still well, I think it like says a lot too about what you're able to accomplish in two years playing collegiately. Oh, yeah. And I know you went on to play in the league for 12, but the fact that you're in the school's hall of fame after the fact, and you only played, I say organized. I know it was at a high level, what you're doing from an intramural standpoint, but to, again, sophomore going into junior year, like it's an unbelievable story. Thank you, bro. It's an unbelievable story. Uh, Ike, we're going to wrap on this final question. And I thought this would be fun. Who is the most famous person in your phone book? Oh. God. Dog. Boy, you don't know. What the hell? You got too much time. The season need to come back on. Whew. I can tell you who mine are if you if you want me to go first. Yeah, you go first. All right, so Ike Taylor's up there for me, no doubt. Uh, I, I was between three in coming up with this. In college, I had the chance to interview J.B. Smoove, the comedian who plays Leon on Curb. So he's up there for me. Uh, on my old radio show in college, I got to talk to the former Bulls play-by-play -play announcer, Tom Dore. He announced the Bulls games for Michael Jordan in the 90s. <laughs> And probably, probably up there for me in this guy's probably among the most knowledgeable people about basketball ever. Uh, Bob Ryan of the Boston Globe, he fills in on PTI from time to time. He's on around the horn quite a bit. I had the chance to interview him as well. So I'd probably put those three. I, Ike Taylor's my number one, but I'd put those three in the mix. <laughs> Sorry. For me, <laughs> I don't know. It's either it's either it's either Lil Wayne, Troy, Uncle Prime. The trifecta. The trifecta. So a rapper, two football players. Yeah, there you go. Ike, that is a full pod. I always like doing the mailbag because we can just chop it up and answer a lot of our listeners and viewers' questions. As always, we leave our contact information in the show notes. So if you want to reach out to us on Twitter, Instagram, or on YouTube, reach out to us. We always love hearing from the listeners. Leave us a five-star review. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the Believe in Steelers podcast. Producer Courtney Vargas from Brinks TV and her team, uh, John, John Brinkus as well. She wanted to make sure that I made mention of that in today's show. But Ike, this is a highlight talking to you week in and week out. Um, go ahead go ahead and sign off and, and I'll wrap it here. Uh, but I, I always love chopping it up with you. Appreciate you. Got to give a shout out to you. Got to give a shout out to Bet Online. 
been with us since day one. Got to give a shout out to Miss Courtney and Brinks TV, her whole crew. Miss Courtney, thanks for working with me. Uh, Got to give a shout out to the Believe podcast for at least giving us the opportunity and the chance. Excuse my sneezing today. My allergies are flaring <laughs> up for all the listeners and everybody who's tuning in. Um, hopefully I can keep this thing under control, but just make sure y'all give us a five-star rate and review uh, every time. Appreciate y'all tuning in and listening. Mark, take it over from here, baby. For a sneezing Ike Taylor, I'm Mark Birkin. Thank you for tuning into the Believe in Steelers podcast. We'll see you next week. Take care and so long, everyone. Peace.